The question of what constitutes the first television reboot is vague, and leaves a lot of room to be really pedantic. Immediately after ending, The Golden Girls became the short-lived, barely different sequel, The Golden Palace. Leave It to Beaver got the new Leave It to Beaver. Sanford and Son became just Sanford. Points for originality here, people, really. All this to say that using the popularity and brand recognition of popular shows to sail the ships of that same show with a new coat of paint years down the line is not new. In fact, it barely took more than a few decades from the invention of mass market television. So why does it feel so current? The first thing I wanted to do here was see if there was any truth to this feeling. The idea that we're swimming in reboots and revivals of reliable popular IPs. I'm far from the first person to make a video on this, but before I jumped into any talking points, I wanted to be sure I wasn't just making a mountain out of a molehill. Well, it's a little hard to categorize what falls under the umbrella of reboot and remake to begin with. Yes, quite obviously all those Disney live-action movies and a third revival of Futurama count. But that being said, every reboot of a famous superhero's film franchise probably counts too, and we get those every few years, and we have for decades. There are multiple concurrent feature film series in the Batman universe alone, as I write this. And that doesn't even get into video games, current and past ongoing comic series, books, etc. I took a quick glance comparing some of the top movies of 2022 and 1972 to get a feel for what I was dealing with here. The vast majority of 2022's top box office releases were some flavor of reboot, sequel, cinematic universe, or adaptation. By contrast, 1972 might look a lot more sophisticated. After all, its top movie was The Godfather, one of the greatest films ever made. But it's worth noting that most of the year's top releases were adaptations of novels or historical events. Also this movie, which I I'm sure you can guess what that's about. I'm not allowed to say it. I d it would seem that since the advent of visual art, adaptation and rehashing has always been in vogue. And this naturally doesn't mean that the art is any lesser for it. I mean, a sizable chunk of some of the greatest works of art in antiquity are interpretations of legends and religious stories. And I have yet to meet someone who believes Botticelli was a hack because he didn't invent the story of the birth of Venus. Well, I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Le leave a comment if you think Botticelli w was a hack. So is it reactionary to say we're running out of ideas? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I think our current issue stems from two fronts. Studios are leaning on popular IPs and in turn preventing great original work from getting time in the spotlight. And the actual products tend to not be very good. I think we should look a little less at the quantity of reboots and more at the quality. In August of 2023, The Hollywood Reporter published a list of television show reboots that had gone past two seasons. The list was 30 shows long and only featured scripted series. Some, like Girl Meets World, barely squeaked by with three seasons, while others, like Hawaii Five-0, managed 10. I could get into the pedantry of runtime, but ultimately this doesn't dictate quality. So I decided to focus more on the critical responses to these shows. There were some heavy hitters on the list. Doctor Who, for example, is still running, just recently got a second wind with the casting of Shurigatwa as the Doctor, and in my opinion, its first few reboot seasons are some of the most brilliant sci-fi television around. There is some slop, like Fuller House, which is allegedly still ambling on somehow. There were some divisive entries, like the Sex and the City reboot, and just like that. But one thing I noticed was a lot of these shows were very... nothing. Middle of the road stuff that didn't expand on its original nor totally soil its legacy. Think stuff like Dallas, Magnum PI, and the X-Files. I adapted my thesis to this. We are not in a crisis of unoriginality. We are in a crisis of boring unoriginality. And it's a hydra with a million heads. My first analytical video on this channel was about King of the Hill. As I script this, that show currently has a reboot that's been in the works since an announcement over two years ago now, in January 2022. Now, bearing in mind that this is one of my favorite shows of all time, one that I could easily watch again and again no matter how many times I've seen an episode, I'm not happy about this. King of the Hill ran for 13 seasons, the majority of which I'd say are truly excellent television. It had a perfect series finale. Why are we bothering with this? What more is there to say? I imagine the answer to this, one that is pressed onto a lot of these reboots and reimaginings, is the potential to see what these characters would do in our current world. And to that I ask, 
who cares? I honestly don't need to know what Hank Hill thinks of Donald Trump or neo-pronouns. There are 259 episodes already in existence, and most of them are great and incredibly rewatchable. I had a similar reaction to the announcement that Futurama's rotting corpse would be revived to dance around for us once again, this time on Hulu. Why? This show technically has two finales, and both of them are pretty great. The last couple of Comedy Central seasons were already showing serious fatigue, and this announcement didn't inspire much confidence in me that they'd reinvent the wheel this time around. And so far, it seems like I was right. As I close in on 30 years old and becoming a wicked, wrinkled old crone, I've seen more and more of the greatest original stories and characters of my youth be revived with the frequency that reminds me of the kaijus in Pacific Rim. Animaniacs, Tiny Toons, Fresh Prince, Beavis and Butthead, twice. That 70s show, Clone High, it goes on and on. And the gap between ending and revival seems to shrink just as quickly. Phineas and Ferb, which ended in 2015 after an eight-year run as one of the most successful Disney television properties, got an order for two new seasons in January 2023. And time and time again, that thesis comes to pass. These shows are worse than bad. They're boring. They don't do anything particularly unique with the original concept. They don't meaningfully build on it. They just coast without sinking, and as long as it gets views, that's enough. You could argue that this on its own is not a big deal, but what do we lose when we make space for these nothing shows? As they take up slots in streaming and cable schedules all the while, thousands of original ideas in the brains of creators, even ones who are well past getting their foot in the door, rot away. Jorge Gutierrez, a decorated filmmaker and animator whose oeuvre includes Nicktoons like El Tigre and original series like Maya and the Three, said in October 2022 that it has never been harder to make originals. Craig McCracken, a living legend in the animation industry who created shows like The Powerpuff Girls and was an institution in the cartoon cartoons era, chimed in saying that he had pitched 16 original ideas to Netflix, none of which his syntax suggests have been picked up. When asked by a fan what made him go back to his old shows, Craig stated, No one is buying originals these days. They only want pre-existing IPs. Just a few months ago, Maxwell Adams, an industry veteran behind hugely successful shows like Billy and Mandy, who's been on the team for some of the most famous 90s cartoons, resorted to financing his projects on Patreon. I don't think the animation industry is going to recover, not in a form I recognize anyway. I could go on all day about the self-hating monster that is the animation business, but I've said it all before. Right now, none of the major studios are making much of anything, and almost all of what they are making is library content. I'm currently doing storyboard revisions alongside a number of other former producers and directors, and I'm lucky to have the work. Once all the mismanagement and the mergers get sorted, though, there should be plenty of room for more mismanagement and mergers. And the AI. Don't forget the AI. If some of the greatest creative visionaries of the eras these studios are clinging to, people with all the connections, experience, and cultural clout you'd feasibly need to get your ideas made, if they can't hope to bring their visions to life, what's left for kids fresh out of Cal Arts and SVA and the Pratt Institute? And what does that say about our cultural landscape? Are we just fated to watch it turn into a graveyard of middle-of-the-road rehashes? Has the entertainment industry, which seems to shrink every day with monopolies and mergers, decided we're just full up on original concepts and can just rely on reviving them forever? I can't say if any of that will pan out, but like, man, I hope not, my god. As I stated in my previous video, it's right here, you should watch it. <laughs> we are in deeply nostalgic times, which, as I stated, is probably rooted in dissatisfaction with our current state of everything. Culture has literally existed as long as humanity has. We have been creating art basically since the second we took our first breaths as a species. This means that we have just as well had millennia of art to reboot in whatever context that means. And we have. I mean, nearly every major European art movement will give you a new flavor of Jesus painting. So why does it feel like right now we're drowning in nothing but regurgitation? And why does it feel so bad? I'm gonna circle back to those two components at play quality against quantity, and the reasons these reboots are happening. As I said earlier, we by and large aren't getting reboots because the creators feel like there's more to say, like there's an artistic statement to be made with it, or because new technology or ideology has made room for innovation with an old concept. 
One of the more well-received reboots of this trend was Bel Air, which literally flipped the script by taking the premise of Fresh Prince and putting it in the framework of a drama. This, to me, is an intriguing concept and one that I might actually want to watch. This is also why I like the concept of one-off movie reboots. They're fun, but they don't bother trying to assume you can drag the nostalgia out for a whole season, let alone multiple. But a lot of these reboots are just... Well, here's these guys. You like these guys. Remember these guys? What's the story, you ask? Good question. Hey! Can you give us money now? The other issue, the why of these reboots, is arguably the bigger problem. Studios are greenlighting the same stuff over and over because it's reliable. Any market research can tell a company that people miss the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, or any time they can remember with a glossy veneer of nostalgia. There's not a gamble in rebooting and reviving. The customer base exists. Even if it's bad, someone will watch it. In fact, a lot of someones. And moreover, these companies are not banking on longevity. They do not care about quality. So it seems like, for the time being, we're going to keep being fed nostalgia slop that's meant to be one to two seasons at most, while brilliant creatives struggle to get their amazing ideas in the door, established or not. My big hope for this issue is that this is just a trend, a blemish on the history of art that someday we'll look back on with an eye roll and gratitude to no longer be submerged in it. If things like franchise fatigue and the diminishing returns of big-budget IP movies are anything to go by, this era might already be starting its denouement. But I can't help but wonder, can we ever have robust art if the world around us is so discouraging of it? When the increasingly monopolized production companies shut out the geniuses of the craft, when those geniuses are too worried about paying their rent to pursue their passions, when the audience can't afford the price of the ticket, when you're too miserable to hear a happy song. Can we have healthy art if the people making it and consuming it are unwell in so many ways? And what does the art of a happier, healthier world even look like? <laughs>